just of our century, but of all of humanity. In today's scripture text, we heard about a military battle the Israelites had endured, and it ended with the Israelites finding safe passage through the Red Sea, while the Egyptian forces did not have such luck and they perished by the thousands. Israel has marched through a number of significant steps as she began to let go of her role and her place in the Egyptian society and prepare to take on her own. This is something of a final launching. It has taken quite a lot to unravel and untangle Israel from her current place in Egypt. First, there were the midwives, who refused to follow an order from the Pharaoh, which was to kill all of the firstborn. And so the midwives found their creative and their clever ways to protect life, to protect the babies that were being born. After that came Moses and his calling to this new kind of prophetic voice. Moses is deeply connected to the midwives because he was one of the babies that was saved by their actions and their work. Moses had always had something of a flair for justice and fairness and had worked in that throughout his life in Egypt, but had gotten into a bit of trouble when some high-powered folks did not appreciate his efforts or his voice. And so Moses flees to another country, and it is in that place that he has this deep spiritual encounter with a burning bush and the voice that says, Moses, it is time for you to go back. It is time for you to continue that work of justice that you had been working on before you left. The next piece to begin to loosen the grip of Israel in their current situation are the 10 plagues. And Moses goes to the Pharaoh over and over and says, let my people go. And the answer over and over and over, nine times, in fact, is no. And each time the situation around them gets worse and worse until finally there is the 10th one. And this is going to be an angel of death is how it's described that is going to come over the land but it will pass over the houses that are faithful, the houses that have the blood of the lamb on their doorpost, which is how we come to call that particular part of our history Passover. So now the people are moving and living into a more detached existence from the one they had had for hundreds of years, and they are now preparing to depart. They are they are packing their bags. They are physically departing Egypt. And so in order to do that, they must cross through the Red Sea. But this is not, this is not just a peaceful hike by any means. As they begin to depart, the Pharaoh changes his mind and says, no, I'm not going to let you go. And instead, Pharaoh sends Pharaoh's army. And so there becomes a battle that ensues between the two groups. So it is a military battle by all traditional definitions. It is in that that the Israelites find this safe passage through the Red Sea. And what's important about this final launching, this travel through the Red Sea, is that when they arrive in a, the desert on the other side, they will be called to a new task. This is the final part of their departure tasks. They're letting go of what was. In the desert, they will begin to engage with the task of what might be, how to create and craft the society into which God is calling them into. On your screens, if you give it just a minute, you are going to see a picture and it should be a triangle. So if you can see a triangle on your screen, will you let me know? and give me some handshakes. Wonderful. This is a triangle and it goes by, it's got a couple different names. Sometimes it's called a drama triangle. Um, and when we call it the drama triangle, don't think drama in terms of just, you know, kind of we use that term to say, oh, that's just a lot of temporary drama. Think about it in terms of like a deep narrative, um, a deep story, 
about how we live our lives. This is one of the things that Israel is working itself through. It is in a drama triangle while it is in Egypt. And what is it? The source of a drama triangle is anxiety. Not the kind of anxiety that we might get for a few minutes here or a few minutes there, but the kind that is really deep seated within us. And it is that voice that says, there is not enough and you are not good enough and you are not going to thrive. It, it is the voice of all the things that prevent us from living into the fullness of who God has called us to be. So when we serve that anxiety, as opposed to serving the spirit of a living God, we can find ourselves in a lot of different roles that protect that anxiety. And so Israel has been in all of these. She has been the victim. She has been the rescuer. She now is in the role of a persecutor in that she has won this battle. She has won this military battle. And there are thousands and thousands of Egyptians who are now dead. She's going to have to wrestle with this question of how much, how much is it worth it? How much death is acceptable for someone else's life? And she's going to wrestle with this in the desert because it's going to be an important question as they form the Israelite society, as they move into the promised land, their understanding of mutuality and their understanding of how to, how to have a system of checks and balances that is both fair, but also one that promotes healing and justice in the long run. This triangle is going to come off of your screen. But remember it because we're going to come back to it because this is, this is the triangle that Israel is working herself through in order to find another place so that what is at the core of her existence is not oppression, anxiety, inequity, but instead it's going to be a thriving spirit of God. Give me just a minute. Um, Israel walked through these steps for departure. And it is actually an ancient template. It is a journey that we all walk. We walk in many places in our lives. We walk it collectively as churches and as cities. St. Francis of Assisi was one who also walked it. Our St. Francis Day today with our blessing of the animals. He was a 12th century monk. But he didn't start off as a monk. That was definitely not his father's plan for his life because his father was a prosperous silk merchant and had assumed and anticipated that his own son would follow in his footsteps and take over the family business. But there was a different plan for Francis. He had a number of different encounters that loosened his grip on what was expected of him. There was a story of the beggar where he was selling prosperous silk wares in the marketplace when a beggar came up to him and asked him for alms. And Francis said, no. He said, no, I'm not going to give you anything. The beggar went away. But in that space of time, Francis had a change of heart and so goes chasing after this beggar and gives him all of these fine silks, not just one or two, but all of them. When Francis returns home, he is not only mocked by his friends and his family, but he receives severe punishment for being so irresponsible with their wealth. He then goes on a military expedition and he becomes a prisoner for a year. While he is abroad, he has a spiritual encounter, a vision. We could say he has a burning bush kind of experience. When he returns, and announces that he's prepared to walk away from this family business, from this wealth. He is beaten by his father. He is imprisoned by his own family. And it's not until his father is away on a trip that his mother, playing the role of a midwife, once again comes to ensure life. And she unlocks where Francis is kept and sets him free. It is a step 
after step after step process of Francis letting go of his worldly attachments of which he has been rooted in since birth and to lean into a fuller communion with the divine. Francis believed that nature was a mirror of God and he would preach to the birds and there's a story of him rescuing a wolf and his journey to let go of all of the worldly accoutrements is a journey that we take too. And we take it all of our lives, walking through the phases to let go of the things that are not serving us well, so that we may have the space and the vision and the energy to move into a unified and a thriving life with God, into brother sun and sister moon, as St. Francis knew it into the celtis and the ginkgo tree as the japanese saplings know it into the promised land as the israelites knew it alleluia and amen alleluia and amen people ours the journey now and ever now and evermore i invite you to bring and prepare your own bread in your cup for this time of communion and if you are able to put it into the chat what you are using today we will incorporate that in our closing prayer for the day all of the different ways that god provides bread and provides cup for all of us this table is a table for all, near and far, high and low, east and west, north and south. This table is for all of us, and it is not our table. It is not a UCC table. It is not an American table. It is God's table, and it is a table of grace. So come and take your place at the table. You are welcome and you are invited and you are called. And so come, let us share this meal together. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts and we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and our praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise. Our Lord, our God, creator and ruler of the universe. Even when we were dust, when our story begins in dust, you were there and your word was there and you breathed into that lifeless void and your word sprang into life all of creation. When we were in the wilderness, terrified and timid, you were there and your word was there with manna just enough for today and water that came even from the driest rock with the abundant grace upon which our story continues to rest. When we fell short, when we became slaves to power and to greed, you were there. Your word was there on the lips of the prophets and in the hearts of the servants, in the stories of revolution and revelation and liberation calling us even now to acts of courage and witness and peace. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels and prophets and apostles and martyrs, with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, 
God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We are mindful that on this World Communion Sunday that we share the bread and the cup this morning and we seek to be in communion with one another, with our family, with our city, with our world, and with the planet. Take your cups and hold them up as you are able. On the night that Jesus died, he took the cup and he shared it with his and brothers who were at the table and said, take and drink. This is the cup given for you. Amen. And he took the bread and broke it and said, this is my body given for you. This in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Holy one for the cranberry, raspberry juice and crackers, for coffee and for lemonade, for fresh huckleberry jam from our sister state, Oregon, for English muffins, for smoothies and fruit and almond, for crackers and coffee and water and more crackers and sourdough bread, for the gift of gluten-free rustic baguette and chai tea, for herb tea, rice crackers, for coffee and toast, for flatbread and for pomegranate juice. We give you thanks. You have provided for us your spirit through the things that are so common that when we look at them so far too often, we see the mundane, we see the ordinary, we see the common. But when you see those things, you see the amazing and the spiritual and the holy. And so give us eyes to see the same way that you see through all of these gifts in our kitchens, in our living rooms, in our lives, in our homes. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. at me then on World Communion Sunday. So in celebration of World Communion Sunday, let me share this prayer from Bangladesh. O oh, Savior Christ, in whose way of life lies the secret of all life and the hopes of all the people, we pray for quiet courage to meet this hour. We did not choose to be born or to live in such an age, but let its problems challenge us, its discoveries exhilarate us, its injustices anger us, its possibilities inspire us, and its vigor renew us for your kingdom's sake. Bless this cup and this bread that it may nourish us for the journey together in hope. Amen. And now we turn to our time of offering. With praise and thanks, we create new life. With vigor and sweat, we deliver our love. With care and hope, we stretch out our hands. We give our thought, gifts of tithes and offerings to renew the world again. Amen. So it should be on your screen now, a slide about donating. So please donate generously through the PayPal link on the website, through a mail donation to the church office, or through a text to give by texting the word Alki UCC to 44321, and a donation link will come back to you. Your support for Alki is more important now than ever, as the church seeks to be a prophetic voice for all people in the year ahead. Would you like to introduce the song?
Thank you again for joining us this beautiful Sunday morning for this musical offering. Joe and I would like to present to you a request from Julia Peeler, Van Morrison's duet with Cliff Richard from his 1990 gospel album. This is Whenever God Shines His Light, which we've affectionately dubbed Whenever God Shines a Light on You. So are you ready, Joe? We're ready, I think. All right. Let's take it away. Whenever God shines a light on me, opens up my eyes. So I can see when I look up in the darkest night and I know everything gonna be all right in deep confusion in great despair when I reach out for God he is there when I am lonely as I can be I know that God shines a light on me Join me in prayer, please. In your creation, O God, we stand on the holiest of ground. May these gifts be a blessing to all that you have made. May the church organizations and people that receive them act as your hands. 
May needs be seen and met, and may the giving fit the need. Through Christ who models infinite giving. Amen. It's it still my turn. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us more, Joe. So we've, last, starting last week, the, uh, we reinstituted the ministry moment so that you would be hearing from the different teams that, that, that are represented on the council. And it happens this week is the time to, for the worship and music team. And we have a wonderful team that has been working hard. We've been meeting roughly twice a month to help provide input to Pastor Kelly and to Betsy and to help design worship services. So many thanks to all of those of you who have been involved. And we're meeting again next week after church to work on the rest of October and the first of November and talk more about Advent. If there are any of you who would like to join our team, you are certainly welcome. Uh, just reach out to me or reach out to the church office and let us know and we will add you to the list. The team comes up with, we come up with ideas, we respond to ideas from Betsy and Pastor, Pastor Kelly, and, we, and then we actively participate in making those ideas turn into reality. Our special outdoor blessing of the animals today is something that came up out of a meeting two weeks ago. And so it's a great way to be part of uh, the life of the church. And the fact that we can't be together <clears throat> in worship, there is still this opportunity to share and, and find a way to be together. So I really do invite you to join us. And to help have a say in part of the service. That's true. That's true. true. <laughs> and a key part of our focus these past few weeks has been to upgrade our technology and the ways in which the worship and music are presented to you. Today, as you can tell, marks the next experimental step in our ongoing quest to make your worship services meaningful and hopefully enjoyable. Through generations do generous donations of time, equipment, and talent, particularly from Gary Gaselchin, Shannon Peterson, and Bob Condor, who is sitting here running the service today, we now have an upgraded internet service with much higher speeds, a new computer which is tied into our existing sound system, and the ability to use that system to provide you with a greater range of music and multiple voices. So with all the things you've been seeing with Zoom where they get two sounds and they're confused, all these separate microphones are feeding into the mixing board and coming back into that computer. So it comes through as a sound that I think you can actually hear and understand. It is still a work in progress, as you can tell today. But we're, leaning, we're learning more every day as we move forward. So, again, I invite you to join us whenever. Wonderful. Thank you. Let us prepare now to turn to our third hymn. And one final quick announcement is that our choir video is working. So we will play that during what is normally the postlude um, portion of the service. So right before coffee hour starts, we'll be able to see the choir video. But let us now turn to our third hymn. All right, everybody, if we don't get any more third hymn suggestions, we're going to do this little light of mine every Sunday starting this Sunday. So let them roll in or we're going to explore this in all styles. All right. <laughs> and um, finally, um, Vicki has, has brought to my attention the theme song from the movie Exodus that I was going to do for a postlude today. And um, in lieu of that, we're going to do the video. So next week, stay tuned for the theme song to the movie Exodus <laughs> as your postlude. Vicki is approaching me. Yes, ma'am. Nancy Halberg chose this in memory of her mother, but it is now important in these fraught times due to its association with voting rights during the early 60s. Fannie Lou Hamer sang it as she was being harassed and arrested by the police for trying to register to vote in Mississippi. It is, imp it is imperative that we keep that light shining as we demand fair access to voting. That puts a lot of pressure on this song. Sheesh. 
Good thing we have a rock and coral arrangement of it. Gosh, that was intense. Thank you so much, Nancy. That was very educational. All right, this little lot of mine. Bonjour, hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, salam, habari, namaste, shalom, and hello. May the love of God surround you and the world. May the peace of God dwell in you and the world. May the justice of God compel you and the world forward. Go in peace. Amen. Let us now prepare for the choir video and we'll give it a second attempt and see if we can get it going. They put in some wonderful work on this. So we're going to cross our fingers that it begins to work. Give it another minute. Someone's not praying enough, I don't think, for this video. We, uh, we'll, we'll, give, we'll give the tech folks just another minute to see if they can get the video. Take 53. <laughs> Just clap their hands and pause for anything you got now. 
Service is now over, and it's time to drink some coffee or tea or whatever. So take yourself off mute and talk to each other. And, uh, and then if you feel like it, come on down, because Pastor Kelly is going to set up outside, and we're going to be doing blessing of the animals in the neighborhood, including the dog who was barking for the last five minutes. So enjoy yourself, and see you next week in worship.